Hi, I'm Natalie Jill, fat loss expert turned high performance coach. When odds are stacked against us, how do we shift and create everything from nothing? How do we level up when we aren't feeling it yet or we've had a big setback? On this podcast, I'll be talking to some of the most inspiring and courageous men and women on this planet who at their worst learned how to achieve success greater than they ever dreamed possible. Leveling up and creating everything from nothing. David Bayer is a leading expert on human evolution, mindset, and business strategy, and he's built one of the fastest growing brands in the personal and business development space. Now, David was recently featured in Success Magazine as a leading expert on the next evolution of mindset. His book, Mind Hack, has been downloaded over 200,000 times, and his recent interview on Impact Theory has had over a half a million views, and his annual event, The Powerful Living Experience, was named a top three must attend personal development event for entrepreneurs. David's work has been referred to as personal development 2.0, and he believes that mindset or the developed capacity to utilize the mind to rewire and reorganize the brain is in the linchpin of the evolution of human species. Join in today and learn exactly how David Bayer levels up and created everything from nothing. Today, I've got mindset coach and business strategist, David Bayer, and I'm excited to talk with him all things mindset. Thanks for being here today, David. Hey, Natalie. Thanks for having me. So take us back because right now you're a leader with mindset and mindset's sort of a trendy, trendy word. You know, we, we see coaches, we see strategists and everybody goes back to mindset. I'm assuming that you always didn't have it totally together with mindset. Yeah, I mean, I always had a mindset, but, <laughs> but it, it wasn't it wasn't conducive to living a, a life that I loved for most of my life, for sure. Yeah, tell me about that. Like, who were you before you became successful with what you're doing right now? Yeah, so I I, I was a, a, like an achiever growing up. My dad was an attorney, and um, like good grades were very very important. Education was very important to us. I was in um, honors education program since like fifth grade. Wow. And so I went, you know, I was going down that track of, of good student and, and quote unquote successful human being. So I graduated from college. I went uh, from high school. Then I went to Columbia University and I always wanted to write screenplays, mm-hmm. but I didn't have a lot of career guidance. And so in the, in the mid to late nineties, I had this idea for starting a business on the internet and, uh, and I did. So I was an early internet yeah. entrepreneur and, um, and so I think 1998, I started my first business. We sold things to college kids for their dorm rooms, posters, bean bags, lava lamps, inflatable furniture. Uh, and then in 2000, I met, I don't know if you're familiar with the Italian motorcycle racing company called Ducati. Uh-uh. And I, I met, so it's, so it's a high-end motorcycle brand. And I happened to meet the general manager of Ducati North America. And he said, hey, why don't you come over and help us build up our dot-com presence? Because we don't know what we're doing. So mm-hmm. I moved to Italy for two years. And then I moved back to the States and in 2004, 2005, I raised a couple of million dollars uh, for a venture-backed search engine optimization company that I started. And this was early in SEO. Yeah. Um, so we like were most people didn't of, even know what that meant at that time. Yeah. And people didn't know what SEO was. And, um, and so we were doing a lot of lead generation. And then around um, 2008, 2009, like, like my whole life fell apart. Oh, yeah. So the, Yours the, and a lot of people's. <laughs> The, the, the business fell apart because the way we were doing search engine optimization, like Google was getting smarter. We were generating a lot of financial services leads. But the, the truth is those were all external things. What was really happening was I was, my life had become unmanageable. So I, I didn't realize it uh, at the time, but I had become a drug addict. I had become an alcoholic. Um, and then one night in 2009, I'd been trying to control my drinking for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd stopped for 30 days. Um, and, and I went out to, it was called wine down Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And I had, I was like, well, I'll just have one glass of wine. And then it was another, and then it was another. And then the next thing I'm, I know I'm out at a club till two in the morning and I woke up the next day. I don't know if I've ever told the story publicly. I woke up the next day, uh, and my body hurt everywhere. And I was like, that's odd. Like I've been lifting consistently. It's not like just muscle soreness. I went to work that day. I'm running a company with 20 employees. And, and, and I came home that evening and it was around 7.30 at night. It all came um, flooding back to me that I had gotten jumped at a bar and had been in a fight. And that's why I heard it was the first time I ever blacked out in my life. 
So you had no memory of this in that next morning until that's how that must have been so scary. Like to the shit out of me. It was like that. That was exactly what I needed where I would. I, I remember saying to my, I started crying mm-hmm. and I was like, I don't like, I don't know how I got into this life. And I had had that feeling for a while. Like I was, I was in this life that wasn't working and I was working so hard to make it work. And I was quote unquote successful, you know, I mean, I'd raised millions of dollars at like, you know, 29 yeah. years old. But like, I, I really knew that things were failing badly. And so, so fortunately, my, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My brother was in addiction recovery about two years before. Okay. Me. Uh, he's my younger brother. And, uh, and I called him and I was like, I don't know what to do. And he was like, well, you're, you're a drug addict and you're an alcoholic. So you need to, you need to go see someone. And long story short, I started seeing a, a therapist who mm-hmm. focused on the addicted brain. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's where I started getting my entree into like how the brain works and neuroscience and neuroplasticity. And then I started working a 12 step program. And mm-hmm. that was my introduction to this idea that there was a power greater than yourself. Cause I did not, I didn't grow up in a religious or a spiritual family. And, um, and it was at that time that a series of synchronicities happened where within the span of like four weeks, I, I went to a, a bookstore, like one of those Hudson bookstores at the airport. Right. I think I had my second appointment with the therapist. I'd gone to like my second or third 12 step meeting. I was not an avid reader. You know how like a book calls from you off the shelf oh, yeah. at that time in your life. Uh huh. And so I walked over and I grabbed this book and on the back of the book, it said, life is full of suffering. The suffering will happen to you. There's a way out of the suffering and the way out of the suffering is the eightfold path of virtue. And I was reading the four noble truths of Buddhism. Okay. And it was this book called Awakening the Buddha Within. And I just grabbed the book. I read it on the airplane and it talked about suffering. And I was like, oh my God, like this is what I've been experiencing, but I didn't have a word for it. Yeah. And I was like, this, this is what suffering is. Then I got back from the trip and one of my employees put a book on my desk called Kingdom Principles by Miles Monroe. And it was, it was basically the same thing Buddha was talking about, which was the same mm-hmm. thing Buddha and 12 Step was talking about, but it was through the teachings of Christ. And so then I read that book. And I was like, there is something going, like there is some structure to life that yeah. I, no one ever taught me. And I ran to Barnes and Noble that evening. And I said to the, the woman at the front desk, I was like, do you have a, a section in the bookstore for people who are like trying to get their lives together? She was, <laughs> she was like, you mean the self-help section? I was oh like, my oh my gosh. God, that's so appropriately named. So, so she goes, it's over there. And I walk over to the self-help section, no exaggeration. In the middle of the aisle, sitting on the ground, there's a little book called Think and Grow Rich. Mm-hmm. I grabbed the book. And then that was, that was, I mean, I haven't looked back since. Wow. So, you know, this is so interesting because, and for anyone listening to my podcast, if they've listened to any number they've, of my episodes, they've heard a pattern that super successful people, they have these uh, experiences of superficial success. Like it looks amazing on the outside. They're hiding something like you were hiding this, this drug uh, addiction and alcohol addiction, really. Um, something has to happen to make them question things. And then people go one of two directions. They either keep repeating that pattern until it really hits them hard enough that they have to look at something or they get the lesson early, which you kind kind of actually did. I just sort of, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though. So I want to dive deeper into this because a lot of people haven't even recognized that they're in this thing yet. They just think thing keeps, things keep happening to them. They don't understand it yet. Back up to the drug and alcohol. Did you on some level know you had a problem with it when you did, or did it take getting jumped in this memory for you to see that? Did you know I, that? I, I knew there was a problem. I, I, I knew that I, I was lashing out at my employees. Okay. I, I knew that I wasn't hanging out with the best friends that I could have. I knew that I wasn't like as connected to my family as other families were. Like there was definitely a disturbance in the force. And then I would just go back into work, right? Because mm. the, the, the idea at that time was all of that can be resolved through success. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So many people have grown up with that belief that they, that they formed. Where, so many questions around this, but where do you think that belief comes from? Like, why do you think success-driven entrepreneurs develop that belief that like they don't offer value unless they are successful? Where do you think that comes from? Well, I mean, I, it, number one, it depends on if you grew up in that type of family. I, like I was in a in a in, an education and success values driven family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea was if I could just grow up and be successful and be like my dad and what kid doesn't want to be like their dad. Right. Like, I didn't know my dad was miserable. Right. Right. But, 
Right. So it's like, okay, so if I can be like, dad's okay, dad's my protector, mm-hmm. or mom is okay, and mom's my nurturer. So if I can just be like them. So if you have successful parents, you know, you, you, you can move in that direction, or you do just the opposite, right? You, you rebel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we get it from everywhere else. I mean, especially in, in the, the virtual world that we live in with, with social media connection, there's the, the Instagram lifestyle or the Facebook sure. lifestyle. And people look like they're happy and we're neuro associating happiness with money and success and business growth. And so it's a pretty predominant theme that naturally influences people at an unconscious level until we mm. become aware of the fact that like there could be nothing further from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I- I'm convinced that there is nothing further from the truth right now. And I, and I also believe that when people fully focus on materialistic or appearances around that, something does interrupt them at some point. It just happens. For sure. For, for sure. Yeah. There's definitely a part of intelligent design in life that, that, that conditions you and trains you through this false sense of happiness over time. Mm-hmm. But then there's a pivot point. And that, and that pivot point is, you know, a lot of people would describe it in, in, in different ways. There's a breakdown uh, because what whatever you've been doing habitually isn't sustainable. And then we move into that conversation of of meaning, right? Like, mm-hmm. and I don't mean meaning like the meanings we give the experiences of our life or our beliefs. I mean, sure. like living a meaningful life. Like, what is my yeah. purpose? What is my mission? What is my, what we would call my spiritual vision? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it tends to emerge out of this. I mean, Joseph Campbell wrote about this, right? It's the hero's journey. Yep. There's, there's a geometry to it in the way that life is expressing itself through us that we go through this where the wound becomes the way. Yeah. Where your pain becomes your purpose for sure. Yes. Yeah. So why do you think, okay, well, I want to talk about the addiction a little bit too. Were you, how did you, how does somebody know that they have an addiction problem? I'm curious your take on that because I'm assuming you said you knew on some level, but I'm also assuming that you also would sort of convince yourself, well, maybe I don't cause I could stop or I don't do it every day. Or how did how do you know? How does somebody listening know that they actually have a problem? Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I can share my experience and people yeah. can relate to it and, and we can find a theme, but, um, you know, it got to a point where I wasn't just smoking a joint three times a week. I was rolling a blunt in my car, headed to Starbucks on the wow. way to work a company with 30 people and smoking half of it and then smoking half at lunch and rolling another one. When I got home, you know, I would, I would buy pot from my pot dealer after having sworn I would never buy again. Cause that was interesting. My- then I would smoke it, feel so guilty about it that mm-hmm. I'd fill the bag up with water, take it to a Whole Foods garbage can three miles from my house and drop it in and four hours later drive back and see if I can get the bag out of the garbage. Like, you, Wow. It, when, you, when you're at that level of addiction, I'm actually really grateful for it, right? Because it's the more subtle levels that are mm-hmm. harder to detect. Like, I mean, this isn't a, my opinion about pot, but yeah. like you, you do ha- it, it, it can be really cunning, baffling, and powerful marijuana because... Um, if you're if you don't go to the extremes that I went to because I am mm-hmm. an extreme person, um, you know you can just like really low level numb yourself and disconnect yourself from from yes. you know your, your higher source, right? So, but for me, it was really it was really obvious. I think I think if you ask yourself a question like is is this habit I'm engaged in um, serving me, mm. or is it or or is it disserving me at any level? Like you'll get that answer. Like yeah, I think I two of you're keeping a secret. Like that's a secret. Like if you have sure, to hide something from way. people, that I think is a big telling sign with anything. I mean, even I look at people that hide doing work from others or hide. Like I think anytime you're hiding something, there's there's an issue there because it's not authentic. Then it's a great indicator hiding for sure. Yeah. So how did you, when you you had this realization that night that you got jumped and you you realized this. How did you then stop? You mentioned picking up books and stuff, but was this a decision? Did you have to like? Did you have to get help from people? Did you own it to people? Like, what was your process to stop? Because that's a lot of stuff to just kind of quit cold turkey. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a combination of things. One, everything starts with a decision. So, mm-hmm. like, I decided this was not the life that I wanted, and then that opened up the resources to 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 come to me that made my recovery possible. Um, mm. being vulnerable with my brother and reaching out to him. I mean, I could have imagined a scenario where like my ego would have gotten in the way and I wouldn't mm-hmm. have reached out and said, Hey, I have a problem. Um, I mean, I, I'll never forget going to my first 12 step meeting and, and sitting in that room with a bunch of people who I had no idea who they were. And I had no idea how this was going to work. But my therapist was like, you're going to go to a couple meetings and you're going to listen to people and you're going to find someone who resonates with you. And at the end, when they raise their hand and say, I'm available for sponsorship, you're going to go connect with that person who's, wow. who's and have a conversation. And I, I went up to my sponsor and I was like, 
um, hey, like, will you sponsor me? Like, <laughs> that, like it was yeah. the weirdest thing, right? Because uh-huh. and I still hadn't even registered in my head, like, what do you mean? I Because, you know, going through 12-step, a big part of recovery is the identification as being an addict. Now, yeah. I think it, my personal belief and, 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 and some of the early work that I did in personal development where I was what, supporting those in drug and alcohol addiction is to then disassociate with that identification and, and associate with it with a future that's greater than you. Okay. But, um, you know, I'm walking up to my sponsor and he's like, you know, you need to go to five meetings a week. I was like, five meetings a week? Yeah. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> so like I, it was structure. It was people. It was the decision. Um, and then I think I'm I think I was really lucky that I stumbled into personal development at the same time because for me, personal development went beyond mm-hmm. uh, drug and alcohol recovery. And I just loved it. Like it became my new, my new addiction. Like yeah. really trying to understand like what is this conversation about how I can use my mind to rewire and reorganize my own brain and 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 how I, do I as an individual expression of intelligence connect metaphysically to to all yeah. intelligence everywhere I mean cuz so I just got super passionate about something else other than smoking pot yeah. David, what would, because there's, there are people listening right now that they think it's harmless. Like they drink wine every night, they smoke pot, it's legal now in California, you know, whatever. They, they think it's okay. And they think personal development is woo woo or weird. What would you say to that? Well, I mean, I'd say a lot of different things to it, but, but um, like, I don't want to, I don't want to go too far out. For, mm-hmm. First is whatever you want to do, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like what, whatever you want to do with your life, you get to do with your life. Um, but just know that if if you have these glimpses or a vision for a life that's greater than the life that you're living, that there's a reason why you're getting that vision. And and so, you know, if someone's happy, at the end of the day, that's what's important. Um, the, the challenge with something like, uh, you know, marijuana or drinking is that it affects your your neurochemistry. And so, like, you're not even really sure if you're happy. It's like happy compared to what? Like, I was so disconnected. Um, to my intuition and to creativity and to inspiration. And the reason why I say it's, you know, kind of cunning, baffling and powerful is like for a while when I started smoking pot, I thought I was being more creative. Yeah. A lot of people do. A lot of people yeah. say that they think it, they, they get better sleep or they're more creative and that's what they need. Right. But- right. And I just got to a point where I believed that the human being can do that on their own. And that's what I became passionate about pursuing. Like what is really possible in my own personal evolution and yeah. what I can and what I can achieve without any type of like third party technology. Yeah, I love I love that. I've experienced I'm no, I I didn't have an addiction with alcohol or marijuana. I, I don't I wouldn't I didn't have an addiction with any substance, but being somebody that is ADHD and have been for a kid, I did have a year where I was convinced from therapists, whoever, that I needed to be taking Adderall. And I remember over that year, I got a lot of stuff done, done that doesn't matter. Like like I would be hyper-focused on a spreadsheet or whatever, just stuff like that. And just like you said, what I realized and I know now is that, okay, maybe I can't focus on things I don't care about 10 hours a day without something, but maybe I shouldn't be focusing on things I don't care about 10 hours a day. And instead I work around when my body is most focused and I've learned to delegate things that I'm not good at. So I agree with you that like within our human, within our ability, we, we can, we just have to look at it different. It's not about yeah, tricking that, the system. Yeah. Maybe you never needed to. And, and I had a similar story where I think probably for 15 years I was on Prozac or Paxil or Effexor to deal with anxiety and it was really hard to come off of. And again, I'm not saying don't use medications to stabilize your sure. system. That's what the doctor tells you to do. What I can share is that once I got off of them, my connection to myself and my emotions and 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 for what I would call God uh, and other people, it yeah. has grown exponentially. Yeah, that's amazing. Do you have to stay away cold turkey now? Like, do you never have a drink now or where are you with that? Uh, no, I, my wife and I will have a glass of wine every once in a while. I, I realized like I was using drinking to get into drugs mm-hmm. and, you know, it's, it was, it was sort of a gateway abuse for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, you know, I don't regularly smoke pot, but, but yeah, I have yeah. a glass of wine. Yeah. So I want to talk more about what you teach and do now and how this serves people, because there's a lot of people that um, they're intrigued by this and they realize they numb out with things because listen, for those of you listening, it doesn't even have to be a substance. This could be you numb out with too much work or overtraining or going to sleep super early or whatever it is. There's a lot of ways people Social numb media out. is probably the biggest one. Your phone oh is my the gosh. biggest one, right? 
Totally. You know, what's funny, especially with everything going on in the world, uh, quarantine and everything, I noticed that I was feeling really stressed and depressed one week, like really. And then I checked my phone and I had spent like six hours on average on social media. I was like, wait, I'm not posting, not creating content, scrolling. And I was like, well, okay, well, this makes sense. So yeah, let's talk a I little felt, bit I about the that. same way. Like yeah. you, you put your phone down next to you. It's like, grab me, touch me, swipe me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then you get lost in like someone's opinion about something and it just changes your whole mood. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you, I, if somebody's intrigued by this and they're thinking, okay, I, I hear you. Maybe I am stuck on something that's helping me numb out or where would you advise if they start to, to start shifting out of that? Where would I suggest they start to shift out of it? I mean, again, I think it comes down to a desire of wanting something more, mm. you know, behind, behind all of those behaviors is an emotion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I think makes the way we teach personal growth so simple and why people have been able to apply it effectively is because um, we talk about we talk about it in a binary way. And what I mean by that is that in any moment in time, you're either in what we would call a powerful state of being Mm -hmm. or you're in a primal state of being. And a a powerful state is a state like joy, curiosity, excitement, passion, Mm -hmm. enthusiasm. And a primal state is a state like boredom or stress or anxiety or overwhelm. And these, these two states are being mapped to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're mm-hmm. either in some form of fight or flight, right? Or you're in rest and relaxation. And, and you're always in one state or the other, and you're mm-hmm. never in two states at the same time. So, so the, the question is, how much time are you spending in a primal state? Like how much time are you spending in stress or anxiety or overwhelm or jealousy or comparing yeah. yourself to other people? Wow. And I think for the answer to most people is a lot. And then, lot. then they do their numb out thing to get them into joy or creativity versus like what you're saying, feeling the emotions, working through it. And, and learn how to transition. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you do that? Like, because there's a lot of people that recognize that they're in boredom or stress or anxiety. Like right now, I know that there are. So, but they, and if they're saying, okay, I don't want to turn to the numb out. I don't want to pick up social media. I don't want to like you said you mentioned deciding, which I, I get, but where, what do they do then? Because I think there's a lot of people hungry for it. They just don't literally know what to do. Well, I've, I've heard you talk about this. There's the two things you mentioned, right? Like one is you've got triggers. Mm-hmm. So you want to take a look at the thinking that's taking place mm-hmm. that's causing the emotion because you know, the, the way the human being is designed and it's kind of like the movie avatar, like mm-hmm. we broadcast in through the brain as intelligence, having a David experience but nobody ever really told us how the machinery works, right? right? And so, you know, those, those, those beliefs that were formed almost all before the age of seven, before the prefrontal cortex was fully formed, which are just the meanings we gave the experiences mm-hmm. of our lives, they, they, they shape the lens through which we experience life. And so the thinking that you're having on a moment-by-moment moment basis is, is always directly correlated to those core beliefs, right? If you think mm. that, that, that you're not good enough, If you believe you're not good enough, you're going to have thoughts of like, oh, I bet she doesn't like this about me or he doesn't like this about me or I'm not doing this well enough or I never do it right. or, And so your your core beliefs dictate your thinking. And then your thoughts on a moment by moment basis, you experience as emotions in the body. So you feel them, right? You experience an emotion. And then those emotions either motivate or demotivate some form of action. And then over time, those actions produce results. And then those results reinforce the beliefs. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the key for people who are feeling like there's more to their life and they're checking out of their life and they know that they're engaged in some form of habitual pattern or behavior that doesn't serve them well is to first notice that you've Mm -hmm. moved into what we would call a primal state, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of easy. Like you either feel good or you feel bad. Yeah. And if you feel bad, to, to know, and this is really about how you get, get into the work or you get a coach or you go to a pro, through a program, but you know this and I know this, but most people don't, that, that the only thing that's causing you to feel that way is your own thinking. So you inquire mm-hmm. within, you go, what am I thinking right now? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm thinking that this never works out for me and it's causing me to be stressed. I'm thinking that I don't have enough time. It's causing me to be overwhelmed. I'm mm-hmm. thinking that, well, I could pick that decision or this decision and I don't know which one is the right one or the wrong one. And it's causing anxiety for you. Yeah. So, right. The only cause of you moving into a primal state, which is really the only problem because everything you want comes from a powerful state of being the creativity, the inspiration, the intuition Mm -hmm. and feeling good. So, 
So that, it, you know, if you were to ask me, hey, what's the name of the game as a human being or an entrepreneur to have a life I love? And I would go, well, notice when you've moved into a primal state and used yeah. to move back into a powerful state. But it's to just know that the only thing that ever moves you into a primal state is not the experience you're having. It's the thinking about the experience. So, so once you notice that you've moved into some form of suffering, right, then mm-hmm. you go, well, what is it I'm thinking? And you begin the self-inquiry process. Mm-hmm. So, so, so that, you know, and that is like, you know, what, what, what the concept of know thyself and the huge yeah. opportunity right now is we're having this conversation because not only are we in a self quarantine, you can put yourself in a spiritual quarantine and it's, it's triggering all this stuff for people. Right. And yeah. so you, that, that stuff is the gold because it's, it's, it's you becoming aware of what you weren't aware of that's been causing you suffering in your life and preventing you from actually living a life you love. So good. You know, it's so interesting right now because I've, I've always told uh, clients that if they can't, if they're wanting to know why they have, they're addicted to something, whether it's social media, drinking, whatever it is, I have always said, just stop doing it and notice what's coming up for you. Because that's, if you stop doing it, it's very clear why you need to do it. Like I'm bored or whatever it is. Um, I need validation. It comes up really clearly. But what I think is super challenging for people and where the missing link is, um, is if they notice what they're noticing, now the next tendency is to stop feeling that way. So they, it's like this, okay, I got, I noticed why I'm feeling that way, but now this is calling to me because if I pick this up or if I do this, I get back to a, a better state. So that's a challenging step. Is that where you would say, okay, if that's you, um, I mean, does everyone go to a 12 step program? What do they do? Because <laughs> like social media is, they, there needs to be a whole 12 step program just for that. <laughs> so, so let me, um, let me make sure I'm clear by what okay. the question because yeah. I think I am. I think it is the question okay. uh, by, by, by sharing a story, right? So yeah. when, when, when I began my journey of personal development, I mm-hmm. told you like I had my breakdown. I started working a 12-step program. I found this therapist that happened to specialize in how the brain works. I start reading all these books and I go on this journey. Mm-hmm. And so the journey lasted about five or six years. And um, so I started reading all the books then you got to start going to the events. I did the landmark forum. I did all the landmark. Done programs. all that. Yep. <laughs> I, and I heard you talk about this in your interview, ALA, Tony Robbins, mm-hmm. doing all these programs. Um, and while I understood, I was becoming more and more self-aware. I didn't know how to change my thinking. Mm. And, and so I went deeper. Don't get me wrong. I had some incremental changes, but like I was still getting triggered. Yeah. And I was still spending more time in the trigger than I would have liked to, even though it was less time. And I actually had this belief that I could escape the trigger permanently. Mm. So, so I, so I go on this journey, right? I start going to India. I went to India three years in a row. I'm studying, I'm doing, as, as you've talked about, I'm doing, uh, you know, various forms of chanting or mantras. I'm yeah. studying ashrams. Um, I go spend six weeks in Sedona meditating on red rocks. I start doing sh- traditional shamanic ceremony. Work. Oh yeah. Did you do plant theory. medicine? Were you doing plant, plant medicine, medicine too? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, so I'm going down the journey, yeah. right? Okay. So, and and ultimately, at the end of it, while there were significant improvements, I was still spending more time in a primal state than I mm-hmm. wanted to spend in. Yeah. So for me, for me, that's kind of what, what we've been calling personal development 1.0. It's been where the technology of personal development has been up until now. Mm-hmm. And now what we're really understanding is that this thing called mindset that you started this whole conversation with, which you're like, it's kind of like white noise. It needs to be defined. And the way we would define it is the developed capacity to utilize the mind to rewire and reorganize your own brain. And it is actually the key to the evolution of the entire human species. Mm. And so this is where this conversation gets really interesting because we're we're now understanding, thanks to personal development 1.0, right? Yeah. We're now we're now talking about how to use our mind to rewire and reorganize our brain, which changes ours at the molecular level, at the DNA level, at our epigenetic expression. And so this is the transition of sort of the mammalian reptilian man and woman into the supreme man and supreme woman of the golden age. And I actually think that's what's happening with coronavirus right now is the beginning of the, of the, of the new development. So, so that's the conversation we're in. And that, that, that's where I've, we've been spending yeah. a lot of time and focus because I, I didn't want to just be a highly 
self-aware human being that was still in suffering all the time. Totally. I wanted to know how I could actually change my thinking. And so what yeah. you said was, hey, so, so people become aware. How do they actually change their thinking? Yeah. I think that's the question. Right? Yeah, that is the question because okay. they they're because what I notice I, with myself included, I get aware, um, and then I think, okay, if I don't do this or what's coming up for me, and then I think about it, and then I still will want to go to that crutch that gets me out of it. It's like I'm missing a step, so I'm asking, and, and it requires it requires energy, doesn't it? Yeah. So you're like you're like, hey, I've learned how to like be in my center and live my life. And as a result of that, I'm not spending as much time in the trigger. That's totally. why my business is growing. My impact is growing. My vision is growing. Everything about Natalie is growing, right? Mm-hmm, and anybody who's mm-hmm. doing this, but then it's like, but am I always going to have to do this work around the trigger? Yeah. Right? Like right. for me, it's boredom. For me, what comes up is boredom. That's where I get to like, where I, I'll, I won't just be with the boredom. <laughs> so that's mine. Got it. So, so what, what we would, what we teach Mm-hmm. is that the experience of boredom is caused by one thing and one thing only, which is thinking. Okay. Right? So every emotion is simply caused by a thinking that's taking place. Uh-huh. And what we found over the course of the last couple of years, it wasn't in the methodology at the beginning, but now we've seen it so consistently that we, we view it as law, is that the only, the quality of the thinking that causes you to move into any form of a primal state is that 100% of the time it's not true. Mm. So what's happened is you've entangled yourself with literally a resonance or a vibration created by your own brain activity that's not in alignment with the resonance and vibration of reality itself. And your nervous system is a guidance system to let you know that you've disconnected from reality. Wow. And so now we can test this and test this and test this. And and, and we have, right? Like when... Um, and so the, the, the process, I'll, t- I'll tell you a story about it because I think so many people struggle with this, but I had a client I was working with uh, privately and um, he understood the structure of what we teach and he was very good at implementing it into his life. And so he was spending way less time in a primal state and business was growing and relationships were growing and everything was growing because all that energy is now going into what he wants, right? And he was invited to a get together with, um, I think it was the vice president of the professional sports team, the number one DJ in Miami. It was down in Miami and it was like all these movers and shakers. It was like 12 people invited to this dinner. He called me the next day and he was like, Hey, I moved into a primal state last night and I couldn't get out of it. Can you, can you coach me on it? And I said, sure. Walk me through what happened. And he said, well, I was at this dinner. It was like this person and this person and this person and this person. And I noticed I started to not feel good. I was moving into a primal state and I said, okay, well then what did you do? He goes, well, I know the only cause of it is my own thinking. So I looked at the thinking. And I said, what did you find? He said, I found this thinking, which was, I don't belong here. Mm. I was like, oh, okay, got it. So what did you do? And he said, well, I remember what you teach, that any kind of thinking that moves me into a primal state is not true. And I said, okay, got it. So if I don't belong here isn't true, then what was true for you? He goes, that I do belong there. And I go, could you find evidence for it? He goes, no, that's where I got stuck. And so I'm coaching him. And as you've powerfully spoken to before, like this, this is the importance of coaching. I knew him. I knew how to leverage him into seeing the truth. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Because he still felt like he didn't belong there. He was like, no, man, this one real estate developer and then this one actress and then this one, like there was no reason I should have been in that room with those people. Insecurity, right? So um, I said, let me ask you a question. I go, you're a pretty faith-based person, right? He goes, right. I go, I mean, if I remember from our conversations, you believe in God, don't you? And by the way, you don't have to believe in God. It was Mm -hmm. just that particular leverage for him. He goes, yeah, I I do believe in God. And I go, so is your God like the all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient kind of God? He goes, yeah, pretty much. That's my God. I said, got it. So how did your God put you in the wrong place last night? And there was this silence. And then he said, oh, my God. And I said, what did you see? Because what we find is that when you're, when you're actually able to see the untrue thinking is untrue and it clears the space, there's a revelation. And it's individual to each and every one of us, which is why it's important to not tell someone what you think if you're going to be a powerful coach. So he said, oh my God. I said, what did you see? He goes, I belong everywhere I am. Now that is a fundamental shift mm-hmm. and reorientation to you and your entire reality. Yeah, that's right? really good. I yeah. belong everywhere I am. So what we believe to answer the question is that while there are a lot of different uh, modalities and structures to get us to, to this, what we believe is one moment of transformation, 
which is the moment that you see what you've been seeing the same way over and over again differently, which is an actual change in the neural networks of your brain. The fastest way to do that is to actually see your unintelligent thinking as unintelligent. The moment you do that, you mm-hmm. can't unsee it. And so the whole structure of what we teach is this very simple step-by-step process to know that anything that's moving me, there are only two states of being. Anything that moves me into a primal state is disconnecting me from, from myself mm-hmm. and everything that I love. And it's only caused because I've entangled myself with a thought that's not true. Mm-hmm. It's not caused by the experience. It's caused by the meaning I'm giving the experience. And the moment that I can actually see that the unintelligent thinking is unintelligent is the transformation. Mm. And so That's we so don't good. actually believe earlier in my work, we do a lot of like go back to my history and find the originating mm-hmm. trauma or belief. But the challenge is, is that the reason why we still get hooked in and have to deal with the trigger, and this is really important to understand, especially if you've been in personal development for a while, is that even if you find the originating experience, all of the connecting experiences still have energy. And so you really yeah. have to go back and disconnect the entire structure to free yourself from the present day trigger, or you just deal with the trigger now. That's really and good. Does that make yeah, sense? It makes a lot yeah. of sense. I think a lot of people spend so much time going backwards, going backwards, going backwards. And it, you're like, like you just said, it doesn't really fix it. You have to still deal it helps with it. Doesn't it help it? I mean, it well, helps you me. then, you know, you know where it came from. That's, sure. but, so that's just an awareness, but it, I don't think it it's helps change the pattern. Yeah. So you so, have to jump so, into the, un, you have to jump into the discomfort. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do. So, so yeah, this is the answer to the question of like, how do I not just become aware, but how do I actually change my thinking? Our answer would be utilize the philosophy to yeah. be able to see your unintelligent thinking is unintelligent because the moment you do, there's a reorganization at the brain level. That's really and good. And I, and I love it. You're not, Cause so many people try to stop things based on willpower and nowhere in what you said, did you mention that? Because I think like that's, you can't just put a block on your phone or you can't just not go to the bar. Like it, I think that is relying on willpower and that doesn't work. So it's so much, it's so much expenditure of energy, right? Because life is energy. Everything we want, like if you kind of look at, there's several ways to look at the name of the game of life, mm-hmm. but, but one of the ways to look at it is to cut off the various forms of energy depletion, mm-hmm. right? So that we can harness all of our energy to be superhuman, right? To have more clarity, to have more vision, to have more intuition, to have more vitality, to live a mission-driven life, to just crush through the obstacles. You, it's hard to do that if at the same time, you're number one, moving into a primal state and you're mm-hmm. expend, expending that energy on stress and anxiety and overwhelm, or you become a self-aware person, but you're applying all that energy to try to hold off the trigger. Well, it's also control. It's a form of massive control and we can't control things. So that's, yeah. it doesn't leave room for error like at all. At all. At all. Yeah. It's, I mean, and again, do I do it perfectly? No, mm-hmm. but I've, I have enough distance between me and that life. Like I've really been focusing recently on allowing. And really trusting that the geometry of life itself is that moment by moment, life is working for my greatest growth, my greatest prosperity, my greatest evolution. We've been talking right now about how this self-quarantine situation is the golden window of opportunity for all of us. But yeah, it's interesting because like, some people are taking it on and really reflecting and a lot of people are wasting the time. Well, it's like you said, if you believe it's an, if you believe it's an obstacle, then it will be an mm-hmm. obstacle. Mm-hmm. If you believe that it's preventing you from doing certain things, it'll prevent you from doing certain things. And if you believe this is the greatest opportunity for growth in your business, in your health, in your relationship, in your nervous system, in your spirituality, in the history of the world, then that's what it's going to be for you. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that. This has been super helpful. What? Okay, tell me about what your event and what you do and your, tell me about all the things that you do. If people want to find more. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I, I have, um, I, I didn't intend for it to be this, but I have a little okay. ebook. That, yeah. I have a little e- ebook that I wrote like three okay. years ago and, um, and people can get it off our website at, at davidbear.com and it's called mind hack. Okay. And so it's, it's the foundation of this philosophy and like, it's amazing. We get emails every day from people like, Oh my God, that ebook just changed my life. You know, okay. people have been in personal development for, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Years. So, and they can just you know, find this on your website at davidbear.com? Find it on the website at, at okay. www.davidbear.com. Okay, awesome. Um, and then we do an event once a year uh, called the Powerful Living Experience. Okay, and what's that? And the URL, and the URL for that is Powerful Living Experience. Okay. Um, it's coming up next March. I don't have the dates in front of me. It's like March 12th through the 15th in Austin. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we were actually like the last event, I think, on the planet this year before <laughs> we, we, we did have the Powerful Living Experience this year. Um, and yeah, it's an, it's an unbelievable three-day transformational event where you experience the methodology um, and um, get together with a thousand plus other mission-driven entrepreneurs. Like we're, we're really clear, Carol and I, my wife, um, you know, our, our focus is on really unifying um, entrepreneurs who want to create the new systems and structures that are going to emerge after this quote unquote crisis. Okay. Um, because, you know, we're, we're, we're living at a time where, um, you know, those of us who, who have, who have become aware, um, you know, realize that we live in a, a predatory systemic world, whether it's the financial system or the pharmaceutical system, we have a child trafficking problem. We have a prison problem. Mm-hmm. We have a, we have a refugee crisis where it's like, we're blaming refugees for the military mm-hmm. industrial complex. That's, pushing them out of their homes. We have a climate crisis and, and we have a governance crisis. And so we believe that all of that's going to be solved through entrepreneurship. So if you look at what I feel we're really being called to do is to help entrepreneurs turn on their superhuman switch through the mindset technology we teach and then teach the business systems and structures for them to go out and for us to change the world together. So good. I love it. So where are you active on social media, David? Where can people find you there? Yeah, I just started being active. So I have my, you know, my David, it's just so weird, like fan page, right? But I have my, my David Bear fan page on Facebook. Uh, okay. I think it's, it's Coach David Bear. Um, and then I have my Instagram, which is David Bear 33. Okay. Um, and, and we're starting to put some really good stuff on our YouTube channel. So, um, you know, you can, you can find me on awesome. YouTube. Awesome. And we'll link all that up in the show notes as well. Where I hang in the socials. Sounds so good. Thank you yeah. so much, David, for today. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Appreciate you, Natalie. Thanks for leveling up with us today. Please share this episode if you found it helpful so others can join in. And don't forget to hit that subscribe so you don't miss out on future shows. And if you would leave me a five-star review, I appreciate those so much. I read all of them and it's how I know that I'm giving you information that you find valuable. And come interact with me over on Instagram at Natalie Jill Fit. I read all the direct messages and comments over there. Make it a great day creating everything from nothing.